Uh, a lot of familiar faces. It's really nice to see everyone and uh, really welcome everybody on behalf of the entire Ocean team. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. It really means a lot to us. As you will see in the presentation, community is right at the very core of the Potion project. And we take these interactions with the community really very seriously. And we're really excited about this first call. We're going to be sharing some new stuff for the first time here with you guys. And so we're really looking forward to your thoughts and feedback. And by the way, feel free to use the Q&A uh, button. Uh, at the end, we will be doing a, a Q&A with uh, the questions people have asked. And also we're handing out some NFT tokens. So anybody who's interested in that, uh, stay up until the end and uh, we'll be sharing the instructions there. So um, we're going to be structuring the presentation around three major blocks. Uh, first, we're going to be doing a quick recap uh, for how we came together during Hack Money. And more importantly, we're going to be sharing the key problems we were trying to solve during the design of Potion, trying to answer the fundamental question, why Potion? Secondly, we will be sharing some initial results after months of pretty deep research, which we're incredibly excited about. We have two pieces of new tech that we're introducing today. One is the Kelly machine, a new AMM for derivatives and risk management. And the other one is the distributed bonding curve, a new AMM pool architecture that ensures optimal trading for users. As I said, this is the first time we're making this public. And so we're really keen to hear uh, people's feedbacks and reactions and, and thoughts. And finally, we will also be taking a quick look at our roadmap and we'll go a little bit deeper into our thoughts as they relate to community engagement, which as I said, is super important to us. In our minds, the real cornerstone for the success of the project. And actually, if I had to summarize our goals into just one, it would be this, to engage with the community. We think of DeFi as a fundamentally different way to develop technology uh, that creates new types of services that are public goods in nature, owned, managed, and driven by the community. And so this really is what today is all about, kickstarting this engagement with the community and the broader internet and inviting everybody to take place and participate. So why Potion? Um, in short, we came together to contribute a new approach to risk management in DeFi. We feel as though risk management is a really important layer in the financial system stack since it allows the system to better handle and absorb shocks. And overall, it just makes for a, a more generally sustainable ecosystem in the long run. But still, why Potion? You know, like there are quite a few uh, derivative platforms out there. So what are we trying to solve that uh, these other protocols haven't solved yet? And before I go into our perceived issues in existing platforms, I wanna make it clear that we take the opposite of an adversarial approach. Uh, we feel a huge amount of respect for all the teams behind these protocols. In fact, uh, some of them uh, inspired us to uh, start Potion in the first place. And so we feel as though we're all trying to pursue different ideas for the same common good of the ecosystem. So zero ill, uh, zero Ill will, maximum respect and good vibes and kudos to everyone out there building for DeFi risk management. And yet for all the existing innovation and promise and technical prowess of these platforms, we still feel as though there are some common fundamental limitations that prevent the ecosystem from reaching higher levels of scale and service. And here are the main problems that we see in them. First of all is liquidity risk. And bear in mind that all these platforms are only possible to the extent that there is liquidity in them. Without liquidity, there is no product. And in our backtesting, as we will be sharing soon, we saw that LPs currently face very high risk of bankruptcy and with very low survival rates in some cases. And so how can you have a sustainable risk management layer if the LPs supplying liquidity uh, in these platforms are facing the risk of permanent extinction, really? We really think that this is a, a problem that needs to be addressed. Secondly, uh, the current systems offer quite a limited range of products. This is related to the fact that in most platforms, liquidity is isolated across instruments like strikes, durations, and so on. 
And this liquidity fragmentation makes it difficult for a wide range of products to emerge. And uh, finally, we, in our view, uh, the current systems still deliver an experience that's quite financial in nature, possibly a little bit too complicated for the layman and excluding all but the most sophisticated people from participating in the system. And so really that's, that's why we're here. We came together to put forward an architecture that helps address these fundamental issues. And uh, in a few moments, uh, we'll be introducing this new architecture, but right at the outset, we want to describe what were the overarching design goals that we were trying to pursue as we were designing the system. So in the first place, we were shooting for a system that had built-in risk management for the liquidity providers, hoping to dramatically reduce the risk they face when they leave uh, capital systematically in the environment. So we want to create a platform where users can add their liquidity, leave it in the protocol for the long run, and have confidence that they go, won't go bust and that it will actually generate compounding uh, returns without the need for active management. Uh, secondly, we designed the protocol with broad choice in mind. Our goal is that whichever liquidity is available in the system should be used for as many products as possible so that users can actually choose the risk product they want. That means choosing between different types of asset, including crypto and non-crypto, as well as multiple durations, like different strikes um, and so on. And we want to make it in a way that obviously it's safe and uh, scalable for the LPs too. And finally, we designed the system to be accessible to all. We really think that one of the opportunities within DeFi is to make a new type of financial service that is... Uh, uh, available to everybody, not just the financial elite. And so we designed with a human perspective in mind so that anybody can participate and benefit. And so with all these goals in mind, uh, what you're looking at on screen is the prototype that we shipped for Hack Money. This was back in uh, May uh, last year. And it basically allowed people to buy put options to serve as an insurance against price drops. And as you can see, it has a sleek and sexy interface. Uh, it uses cool and friendly language that's fun and non-intimidating, hoping to appeal to the broadest market possible. Users were able to select their asset, strike and expiry from a broad range of selection. And we chose to price the trades in this platform according to Black Scholes, which is one of the industry standards hoping to achieve a mathematically fair price for both sides. That said, uh, pretty quickly, we stumbled on some pretty serious problems that actually threatened to kill the project. And I'm gonna hand over to Aureliano, who's gonna uh, go through them. Yeah, so when we tested this Black Shows implementation in our simulation environment, the results were not great at all. Even if one could price the options using realized volatility, Black Shoals would leave LPs totally exposed to extreme drawdowns. So severe that bankruptcy is almost inevitable for long-term LPs in, in, in that particular protocol. So this is what we're illustrating in this figure here, where the vertical axis shows the size of the maximum losses observed for LPs writing puts for different assets. And here, pink bars represent crypto assets. And as you can see, losses can be uh, of up to 100%, meaning total bankruptcy for the LP, right? Next slide, please. So we scratched our heads for a while, trying to understand like, why, why Black Shoals was performing so badly for LPs. The answer was Black Shoals is fundamentally assuming that underlying prices move smoothly according to Gaussian distributions. That would correspond to the purple line here. That as you can see, has a lot of probability mass in the center, but zero probability in the tails, meaning that large price swings are not contemplated. But crypto assets behave exactly the opposite, as in the pink line here. In crypto assets like ETH or Bitcoin, there is a significant, very significant probability that the price will move suddenly and dramatically, exposing the LP to very high risk. 
And Black Scholes despises this risk. And this explains precisely the high bankruptcy rates observed uh, in the previous slide. So let's take a step back for a second and consider the situation that LPs are facing in current, in current DeFi option platforms. When a liquidity provider faces a problem of underwriting options in DeFi, she's fundamentally interested in how the premium she's charging for such underwriting is actually calculated. And generally speaking, in terms of pricing strategy, we could classify the currently available solutions in DeFi, uh, in DeFi options in two different blocks. One, which would be those protocols using model-driven pricing strategies. Most oftentimes, the model of choice is unfortunately for the LP Black Shops, which we have just exemplified in the previous slide, uh, how flawed this can be in terms of bankruptcy risk for an LP. So the second block of protocols will offer market-driven pricing strategies. By market-driven, we should understand some sort of algorithm that aspires to price discovery by somehow, somehow tracking demand. With this, you're basically giving yourself to the market, so to say. And so there's no notion of risk management or any possibility of backtesting LP performance for that matter. So here at Potion, we're proposing a third way, a middle path that is market sensitive, but also model driven at the same time. Uh, Intro our approach is actually quite different from, from existing ones and is based on the concept of LP pool utilization. So the intuition behind utilization based pricing is, uh, is, super, uh, is super simple. So suppose I'm LP with some capital pooled, say $100. I'm waiting to get orders from buyers and I'm going to automatically sell them options. Now, imagine the following two scenarios. In the first one, a buyer comes and requests an order worth $1 of collateral for a given option, right? So the buyer is asking effectively for me to put a risk 1% of my pool. Now, suppose that trade went very badly for me. Uh, like I'm selling an, at the money put and the price drops 50%. Now I'll be losing 50% of the capital at risk in relative terms, but I will only be like 0.5% of my total pool capital, right? So it will have a very small impact on my PL. Now imagine a very different scenario where the buyer requests an order worth $70 of collateral. Now suddenly I will be uh, risking 70% of my pool at once. The situation will be quite different because now even at a smaller relatively loss, say a 20% price drop from an at the money put, I will be suffering a 40% loss of my PL. So pretty significant impact on my PL for this case. It's quite intuitive to understand that in the first scenario, I should be demanding lower premiums than in the second scenario, mainly because I'm exposing my capital to lower risks. But uh, you know, the real question is if I want to move this from a high level intuition to a particular mathematical expression relating the LP pool utilization with a premium of an option, uh, there's doubts on how should I go about this uh, rigorously. And this sort of question is precisely what we've been researching for weeks and probably months intensively. And now we're super exciting to give you the sneak peek to the solution we have found. And as you'll see, it has to do with the Kelly criterion. I'm handing it over to you, Mike. Hi, everyone. So um, this is a brief intro to the Kelly criterion, but this guy, John Kelly, is a famous physicist who worked at Bell Labs for AT&T in the United States during the 1950s. Um, and he worked very closely with a mathematician named Claude Shannon, who's famous for inventing information theory. And this branch of math is used all around us every day because it's used in communication systems and in data compression and encryption. Um, so it's a very important branch. If we move on to the next slide, we can see just a quick primer. Um, so this formula, the Kelly criterion that's named after John Kelly uh, is very well known by gamblers because it's used to give a casino edge uh, to gambling games so that they statistically win on average. Um, 
And it's also used by card counters and successful investors and traders like uh, Warren Buffett and Jim Simons and Nassim Taleb. Um, so just to explain uh, this graph and what it's showing, uh, for the given probabilities of a game of chance and the payout for each of the outcomes, uh, this graph gets generated. And on the x-axis here, we have zero uh, representing the gambler betting 0% of their money. And on the right here, we have one for the gambler betting everything. And so for the given uh, probabilities in the payout, there's an optimal bet fraction here because on the y-axis, we have the expected growth rate of the gambler's capital. So we can see um, you know, if you bet less than the optimal, uh, the gambler has no risk of going bankrupt, but their money won't grow uh, at the optimal rate. So they're underbetting. Um, and if you are using a bet fraction that's in the red area, you're overbetting, uh, and there's risk of the gambler going bankrupt. You can see as it approaches the gambler betting 100%, this growth rate uh, tends to negative infinity because if you think about it, like even if a gambling game, say, had a 70% chance of paying out and a 30% chance of losing what you bet, if the gambler were betting everything uh, and the 30% happened, they'd lose everything and the game would be over. So it's really about balancing what's the optimal bet size. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, we have this open question of how can we relate the pool utilization of the LP uh, and their bonding curve uh, with the Kelly criterion to figure out what is the optimal curve. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, we can see the normal application of the Kelly criterion for a gambler is to say, okay, for given payouts and given probabilities, what is the optimal bet allocation and bet size? Um, but on the next slide, we can see uh, generating our bonding curves, we are using the formula in reverse. And we say for a given bet size and the probabilities, how much should we charge in premium, which affects our payout on the option contract uh, to make sure that our bonding curve is optimal. So um, we can see that uh, this bonding curve is generated using this reverse application of the Kelly formula and it, it links the two uh, mathematically. So if you think about it, um, the LP's primary concern isn't really about whether their option is priced correctly according to some theoretical formula like the Black-Scholes. The primary concern is whether the LP goes bust and loses their investment. And then after that, whether the LP is making money over time on average. And using the Kelly formula uh, ensures for the LP that both can be true um, in order to keep their investment as safe as possible. And the reason this is so important is because without the LP survival ship, there in the long term, no service can be provided for the options trading. Um, so, I'm going to hand things back to Alpha Block to continue. Uh, so thank you so much, Mike. And uh, for people who may not be super familiar with the Kelly Criterion, I really want to say that it, it really is one of the holy grails uh, in risk management. And perhaps the reason it's not more widely adopted, it's because of the mathematical complexity associated with it, which makes it inaccessible for the vast majority of people. Uh, to our knowledge, this is the first time that the Kelly criterion is actually being used to calculate premiums as opposed to allocations. And in addition to that, we've been successful in finding a gas efficient implementation of the Kelly criterion through a bonding curve that is super simple to use and that hopefully will change this and will make the, the power of the mathematics behind the Kelly criterion easily accessible, not just to PhDs in quantitative finance, but to the general public too. So let's dive right into it. And we're looking now at the architecture for the Kelly machine. 
And this is how it works. An LP basically sends capital to a smart contract that's decentralized and living on the Ethereum blockchain. And the LP is able to bind capital to a Kelly style bonding curve. That means that they can actually choose the Kelly optimal, or they can actually further uh, refine the curve they want uh, to express precisely their risk reward preferences, as we will see in a bit more detail in a few moments. Once that's done, then this capital becomes available for counterparties that are able to trade with this machine uh, and send premiums to it to receive collateralized financial products such as insurance or put options or call options. Now, the important thing here is that every single trade will be priced according to the bonding curve, which guarantees all the robust mathematical return and survival expectations that Kelly gives you. And as you can see, uh, automatically when the utilization in the system is high, premiums will be higher. And when the utilization of the system is low, premiums will be lower. So this results in an automated effect where the LPs are being risk responsive without actually having to manually be fiddling with the pricing the whole time. Another way to think about the Kelly machine is through this higher level abstraction. So you can look at it from the perspective of the LP in which case it really behaves as an automated capital manager. So the experience for LPs is they're able to send capital in and in return, they can expect to get alpha out or basically they can expect their capital to compound over time. From the user perspective, it can be seen as an automated market maker or an AMM. And the experience there is very simple and actually similar to what you experience in Uniswap or Balancer or Curve, but instead of doing swaps, between assets, you're basically sending premium in and getting these collateralized financial contracts out. The idea behind the entire system is that it's designed for long-term capital growth and survival. It's based on this really robust mathematical framework, the Kelly criterion. And it actually creates a really natural way for the market to converge around a risk reward frontier. And I'll, I'll be talking about that uh, in, uh, a little bit more in a few moments. And also crucially, for the first time, this is a paradigm that's uh, fundamentally back-testable, which is something that for us was also really important. And now we're actually going to be transitioning into looking at some of the initial results to the back-testing that we did. Uh, basically, in these back-tests, we have thousands and thousands of uh, simulated LPs that are all starting with a $100 balance and leave the capital invested for up to 30 years. So that means that if I'm simulating what's the response for me selling 10% of the money Bitcoin puts, I can, I can trade that systematically for 30 years and look at what's going to happen uh, to my capital. And we spend a lot of energy in building this because this is all pretty new. And we wanted to make sure that we had a good idea for what results can be expected. And so it's super flexible in, in the sense that it allows you to select what type of contract, whether it's a put, a call, a butterfly, or any other more complex structure, there is no limitation to what you can price with it. It allows you to choose the underlying asset and also what type of market regime do you want to simulate? And in our case, we sim we're trying to find the, the envelope. So we go from a permanent bear markets that last for 30 years, all the way to permanent bull markets that last for 30 years as well, and everything in between so that we can really look at the full spectrum of results possible. And then the idea is that after these 30 years of simulation, the system will be keeping track of what's the alpha that is being generated for the LPs, what's the lowest balance that the LPs can experience at any given time, and then some statistics on what's the overall win rate and what's the survival. And I'd love to go through the whole thing, to be honest, but uh, today we don't have uh, all the time in the world, so we're just going to be concentrating on risk or alpha, uh, sorry, risk, uh, which is this lowest balance or end return, right? Which are the, some of the most important uh, KPIs for, for an LP. So uh, let's start with the alpha. Uh, the alpha is also, uh, uh, you can think of it as the, the capital compounding power uh, generated by the Kelly machine. And what this chart shows is the capital compounding rate experienced by thousands of LPs selling 10% out of the money Bitcoin options priced with this reverse Kelly application that Mike described earlier. 
through the Kelly machine. And I just want to make it clear that uh, uh, by compounding rate, we're not looking at the, uh, the, uh, the final return. So when you see here that on around year seven, uh, LPs are kind of converging to this 40% uh, compound rate, this means that this doesn't mean that they gained 40% in seven years. It means that they uh, gained 40% every single year for seven years straight. Yeah, so that's, that's what we are looking at. This is the compound rate over time. And quite clearly, you can see that initially the LPs have some variance. So in the early days, some LPs face some losses and some LPs face some outsized gains, but that as time goes on, they all seem to revert back into some mean. Um, and this um, illustrates the power of Kelly. Uh, when I trade using premiums calculated with the Kelly engine and charge them systematically over time, I can expect to end up with a compound rate. And this is exactly what this is showing. Another way to think about this is uh, just like it was mentioned a few moments ago. Uh, you can think of it as I am playing as the casino and I want to be the house. And maybe I'll suffer some immediate losses. Maybe I'll, I'll suffer some losses in some bets, but provided that I keep playing and playing and playing over time, I have some mathematical edge that guarantees that I will be on top. And this is exactly what's, what's happening. And it, this is the power that Kelly is giving to the LPs. It's allowing them to become the house in the casino with the difference that now anybody can be an LP. You don't need to have any particular licenses or anything complicated. It's open to, to everybody. And so one question that we immediately had was, uh, whether this alpha could actually be selected. So we can see here that the alpha is kind of converging to 40%, but could we actually fiddle with the bonding curve that we were finding? Uh, and for example, at a 10% or a 20% on top uh, to see what would happen to it. And this is exactly what this chart shows. Uh, by the way, this is exactly the same chart as below as before. So you can see here that it has kind of this shape. So what you're looking at here uh, in green are the worst case scenario. So out of all the thousands of simulations, the, the worst one in gray, you can see the best one. So that's kind of the, the envelope for results. And then you can see the quartiles in between. So yellow is the first quartile, orange is the third quartile, and in pink, you see the median. And I just wanted to make two quick observations. Uh, there is a direct link between the pricing curves that are used and the alpha that is generated. So you can see it very clearly, if I multiply the Kelly optimal curve times 1.2, a 1.2 factor or a 1.1, the alpha that I am expecting grows and it grows across the board. The, like the lowest ever result is higher as well as the highest ever result. So the entire uh, mass of the results moves upward. And then the second point I want to make is that if you notice the moment I go below Kelly, so the moment I, instead of doing Kelly optimal, I do Kelly minus 10%, then I no longer have a positive expectation of return. You can see that the pink line is now below the zero. And so we think that this is actually an important result because even though LPs may have the ability to price whatever they want, the users will see it, right? And the users will know whether they're trading with a pool that has selected this outrageous price or whether they're selected, they're trading with a pool that has selected this really incredibly positive price for the user. And we expect the market to naturally converge to some pricing that's very close to the 0%, just, just giving uh, some LPs just enough edge to expect some positive re returns over the long run. Um, so far, we've looked at returns. Let's now look at risk. So here we're looking at something called maximum drawdown. And for clarity, I just want to explain uh, what that means. Uh, as we said, LPs that put capital to the Kelly machine may suffer some initial losses before they actually revert back into the mean. What the maximum drawdown shows is the lowest balance ever observed during the entire life cycle of the investment. So as a quick example, if an LP starts with $100 and its balance goes down to say $20 at some point, that corresponds to an 80% drawdown. Even if ultimately over the long run, the LP ends up making a, uh, some gains, 
uh, for that simulation, we would still say that the maximum drawdown observed was 80%. And so that's, that's what we're looking at here. And we're comparing three things. We're comparing the results experienced when using Black Scholes, which uh, Aureliano showed earlier with this really scary 85 to 100% potential loss for crypto assets. And you can see how by pricing these exact same simulations. So this is the exact same price paths simulated and price for Black Scholes. If I instead price them using the Kelly engine, I can really easily see the value that I'm getting, the value that the Kelly criterion is giving to me, which is that I'm very dramatically reducing the risk that I uh, of uh, suffering losses. Uh, and that applies both to uh, fiat assets as well as crypto assets. So it, it shows that Kelly is able to overcome this limitation from Black Scholes and actually handle fat-tailed assets uh, like we were talking about earlier. And once again, if instead of choosing a bonding curve that is priced with a factor one, I price it with a factor 1.2, I can actually dial even further down the maximum loss expectation that uh, LPs will receive. And hopefully this illustrates how as an LP in a Kelly machine, I have tangible data for the losses I should be expecting, allowing me to make robust decisions as opposed to operate blindly, not having any idea for what losses I may expect or, or what returns I could get. So just to finish this section, let's now look at uh, the, both, both of these dimensions at the same time, showing the reward and the risk in a single graph. So on the horizontal axis, you see the maximum drawdowns. And on the vertical axis, you see the actual, the, the terminal balances that these LPs saw. And in this particular instance, we're looking at uh, uh, returns after five years of systematic trading. And each dot in this graph represents a particular instrument. And there are a, a ton of instruments. There are like 8.5 million records uh, uh, powering this chart be behind the covers. And we're looking at seven different assets, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Gold, Chainlink, Maker, uh, S&P 500, and the Turkish Lira. We wanted to have a, a, a good range of crypto and non-crypto assets. We're also looking at utilization ranges from 5% utilization to 99% utilization for options priced from 40% out of the money all the way to 40% in the money in 10% uh, intervals. We're also looking at different market parameterizations. So for, from bear markets to bull markets to lateral markets for a number of durations. So as you can see, we're really testing a really broad range of potential instruments to see what happens to the LP. Uh, what, what happens to the life of the person that is putting capital into the system. And it's really easy to see that uh, in white, you have the results for the LPs that were pricing their put options using Black Scholes. And immediately you see that it just looks really different to the other ones. It has a, a pretty large amount of cases where uh, after five years of trading, LPs are below the initial $100. And also uh, you can see that the drawdowns are kind of wild and uncontrolled all the way down to pretty much losing everything. And hopefully you can see just with the naked eye that this is a very different situation with the Kelly criterion. In blue, you see Kelly criterion factor one, and you can easily see that the drawdowns are very well managed. They don't go below 40%. And you can also see that there is not a single uh, blue dot that's below the hundred dollars. So that's exactly what I want as an LP. You know, I, I'm happy to take some risk. I'm happy to momentarily be below the hundred dollars, but I, I want to have an expectation that over the long run, my capital is going to uh, grow. And if actually I price with uh, Kelly with a 1.2 times factor, then I'm able to actually fully customize the risk that I'll be exposed to. And so I really hope that this kind of illustrates the level of information that LPs and users will have at their disposal. And to me, it almost begs the question, why would you put your capital at risk blindly in some other platform when you have a platform here that allows you to totally fine tune the risk exposure that you're putting your capital to? Uh, some uh, people may be thinking, okay, so this sounds uh, interesting, but uh, it also sounds a little bit complicated. So is this going to be 
like a super difficult experience for, for users. And like we said at the beginning, we're totally committed to creating a, an environment that is accessible to everybody, not just the financially educated people. And so this is the type of experience that we actually envision. It, uh, in this screen, you see the experience for LPs. And there will be two routes for LPs. One route will be to actually define their own bonding curves. So we will be making tooling available so that people can trustlessly work out what's the Kelly optimal curve uh, and actually play with it, play with the estimations, play with the approach. There is a lot of uh, heavy mathematical stuff going on in there. And so if you're a sophisticated hedge fund or you just like uh, to play with that stuff, you can go to town with it. You can create your own curve and the system will allow you to write it. Uh, also, if you're not in this category of people, you can also choose to simply select a template, a template that we have prepared for you or some other third parties may also be able to kind of pre-cook some uh, curve templates and really simplify the experience by allowing people to simply make a choice as to do they want a low risk type of environment, medium risk and high risk. And each of these choices with the corresponding estimation for what's the risk, uh, what's the maximum loss that they should expect as well as what's the a return that they should expect. And I want to make it clear that regardless of whether you decide to go for a bespoke curve or a template, it's going to be trustless end to end, meaning that you'll be able to fully see all the calculations, how they're derived and come to your own conclusions as to whether this is something that you can trust or not. Uh, we're not going to go super deep into the user experience, but just, uh, but just to say that uh, this is not only exciting for the LPs in being able to work out all this statistical information, but it also allows users to have this experience that we were talking about, an experience where they can select from a range of assets, they can fully customize the duration and the strike. And so really we're trying to give the, the best of both worlds, you know, like a, a really nice experience for the LPs as well as for the users. However, uh, this came with its own uh, complications. And so... I'm going to hand over now to Ethan, who's going to be talking to us about order routing. Thank you. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So in this presentation, I think we, I hope we've made it clear that Potion like really strives to create a fair market for LPs. And we still want to show that this is a great market for buyers. And to buy a derivative uh, contract, the buyer must first locate counterparties that they're interested in buying the contract from. So these are the LPs in the scenario. Just like the rest of the world, a buyer never wants to overpay for a good or service. So the buyer goes to the potion router to find the cheapest LPs to interact with to buy an option. In DeFi options right now, we've noticed that there's mostly two architectures for applications. One where capital is managed like centrally and one where capital is managed on an individual basis. In the peer to pool scenario, this is where capital is managed centrally and the peer to peer uh, is where capital is managed more on an individual basis. Um, in the peer-to-pool method, perhaps you have some centralized uh, authority setting some sort of parameters and maybe they're using black shoals. In a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, case, you could be on some market just like trading on Uniswap and just have some tokenized like risk tokens. So we want to propose a middle ground because there are some trade-offs between the two. Uh, the peer-to-peer -peer is far less gas efficient, but it creates almost a more like it creates more price competition and the peer to pool is much more efficient from a gas perspective. But we wanna propose something in between, much like our idea behind utilization pricing, we're trying to use the best of existing systems to create the best experience for our users. Next slide, please. So each LP has their own capital with a curve that describes their risk profile on a specific asset. And this router can observe this market and then send orders to the cheapest LP. This creates a risk and a return trade-off for LPs, right? So either an LP can charge a really high premium and there's a risk that the router won't ever send orders to them because they're just so much more expensive than everyone else. But they, the, an LP could also charge less than the other uh, LPs and make a smaller amount of returns. From a buyer's perspective, uh, this router simplifies the process of creating an order since it appears that to the buyer that they're only interacting with one LP. If in this case, if the router, if the user was actually to allocate uh, capital to each LP for an order, it'd be a really tedious process, but the router really abstracts this and allows them to hide this complicated process. Uh, next page. So um, in this 
uh, slide, we created a complex simulation environment uh, to test the router. This is somewhat similar to the, uh, the test we were showing earlier. So on the left-hand side of this graphic, you see that there's nine uh, curves for nine LPs. And on the right side of the uh, router, we call this the emergent bonding curve of this bonding curve of the system. Um, and this is the output of the router for the total amount of liquidity in the system. And as LPs arrive and users buy options from the system, you can see that the price of you know, the options change drastically and this curve shifts a lot. Uh, on the right, you will see a blue and some white points. So the white points are random samples taken from all of the LPs. And this would simulate if a buyer just showed up and wanted to buy random quantities from different LPs. And it's important to note that in the emerging bonding curve of the system is uh, empirically less than or equal to all of the random points. So this means that uh, if you are able to take a huge sample of points, that on our, like our, uh, our bonding curve is always less than that. So it's showing that our router is very, very good at allocating orders. Uh, this means that the potion router is extremely accurate in, gener in generating the buyer uh, the best price available. And the router provides them this low price while shielding them from the complexity of interacting with many LPs. Uh, next slide, please. And here we're gonna introduce Christian on the new and updated design system for Potion. Hi everyone, I'm Christian from Design Area. Today, I'm very happy to be here and present to you uh, our latest news on design. Please, next slide. So uh, our journey started in, uh, during the Akmone Hackathon, where uh, in few days, we were able to create uh, the brand concept using this fancy language uh, in order to communicate uh, uh, with this financial space and provide access to DeFi for non-professional people. The Hackathon experience represented for us the, the basis to structure our naming, logo, colors, and visual assets. Then uh, the work done last few months has brought an evolution of Potion's work with many new assets like gradients, textures, new iconography, and brand imaginary. Please, next slide. The new design guidelines aims to convey two strong messages about Potion. First one is to be fluid. Potion was born uh, on the web, but we think it should live everywhere and this should be reflected by our way to communicate. The second one is to be human-centered. We believe we are people, not users, and we aspire to provide the best possible experience in terms of uh, usability. About that, I strongly recommend to everyone in the community to participate in our next user research activities like usability tests and surveys. Next slide, please. Well, the, the website was our main milestone on communication side during last month. We designed Potion's landing page to provide a good gateway for people in order to know what's Potion and now interact with us. The website also shows uh, our key product features toward the, the V0 release. And in addition, it provides some cool visual hints on what will be our look and feel and design languages. This is our uh, new landing page. As you can see, we, we provide two different uh, way of, of views, like uh, the, the, the light mode and dark mode. And, and then we, we have also many, many sections uh, uh, aimed to, to explain what we, what we are doing and, and other details about us. And then I, I think that's all, that's all from my side. Now on the ball pass to Nim to talk about the, the roadmap. Well, so we are, we've been working hard on V0 already for the last few months. Um, and the aim of V0 really is to prove out all, all the concepts you've heard today with kind of real money and on the line in a real environment. And I think, and then also kickstarting the community. Uh, with that in mind, we want to get that out sooner rather than later. So we'll, we'll be compromising on some features and then V0 will really be focusing on put options, 
um, for a limited number of assets and, and there will still be some centralized control of the system at smart contract level. Um, I'm not going to commit to specific dates for, for that release at the moment, but we're hoping to release it uh, very soon and then and then start working on V1 and in, in earnest. V1 probably includes features like more assets and extending to calls and spreads and hopefully some, some clever pricing improvements and um, scaling the system, uh, both in terms of its throughput and its transaction fees. Um, but we also, we want V1 to learn from V0 and from the feedback we get from, from people uh, on, on, the, on the real v, V0 release. So none of those things are really set in stone, but what, I guess what is clear for V1 is that we want to widen the product range and decentralize control of the system and really focus on growing, further growing the, the user base in the community. And so that leads us on nicely to Sean, who's gonna talk a bit more about community. Hi everyone, I'm Sean, the community and social manager at Potion. If we can move to the next slide, please. Firstly, I think it's really important to stress again that Potion is always aimed for a decentralized and permissionless architecture. It's what Potion is all about, and we are committed to keep moving in this direction. In this sense, Potion does not belong to any of us, but rather belongs to the users of Potion via community ownership. Given these factors, community building is going to be crucial to Potion's success, and we will strive to make it as welcoming and engaging for everyone as possible. In terms of community goals, we want to keep everyone informed and involved with Potion's, Potion's statuses, updates, and timelines. There will be community calls like this one today, as well as Medium articles and a variety of other digital content. It's important for us to provide structured feedback opportunities from everyone in the community, whether that be now in the community call Q&A, feedback surveys, or simply on Discord. Your feedback and opinions will be paramount as we consistently adapt and drive Potion forwards. There will be a focus on education and community awareness, conveying the benefits of Potion and doing this in layman terms. We are aware that under the hood, it can appear quite complex with maths and charts, and this might seem scary to some. However, we don't want to make this an overwhelming experience, no matter your knowledge level. So we will be focusing on clear and concise education. One actual example of this is some explainer and animated video content currently in production. So we're super excited to see those come to life. We really want to stimulate community involvement and there will be many ways to contribute from a developer to an enthusiast on Discord. And we'll be actively seeking out community engagement. One such example is an early tester dedicated feedback group we are setting up. In fact, there will be a survey to complete at the end of the call. And if you wish to participate in this early testing group, be sure to note that at the end. On the next slide, we actually have an NFT badge for everyone here today to commemorate the milestone of our first ever community call. I'd like to give a shout out to everyone at the proof of attendance protocol for helping us to put this together. All you need to do to claim the NFT is provide us with some honest feedback and fill out the survey that will pop up when you exit the call. Then in the coming week, we will send you an NFT claim link. On the right of the screen, you can see how the claim page looks like. So you can mint your NFT with no transaction costs on the XDAI sidechain in one click. You can move your NFT to the Ethereum mainnet, but probably best to leave it on the XDAI sidechain for now, especially with such high guest costs at the moment. So yes, please be sure to provide feedback when you exit the call. Very finally, you can expect to see Potion involved in all sorts of community activities from AMAs, podcasts, speaking at online events, conferences, ambassador campaigns, meme competitions, and even the odd giveaway. So there's a lot lined up for this year, but bear in mind all of this will be gradually phased out over time and not happening all at once. I think that covers the basics from myself today. And I believe Aureliano wants to say a few more words, so I will pass over. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Sean. So before the concluding remarks, let us call for everyone who is interested in joining the project, come to us and participate. We want to engage the best minds in the DeFi community, and we encourage you to share this vision of becoming the reference layer for decentralized options pricing. We're currently hiring seasoned specialists to join our team, working on front-end development and web-free integration. 
we're also super happy to consider experienced smart contract engineers to join our team. And if you happen to be passionate about data science analytics, we believe Potion is your place. As you've seen, we're all about scientific approaches to DeFi building, and we're generating a ton of data that can have incredible applications from machine learning and financial engineering and so on. Also, if you think you have ideas compatible with our approach, we're happy to explore collaborations with our teams that want to you know, use Potion as a base layer for further products. And finally, for anyone listening to this and interested in building a community from bottom up here in Potion, there will be chances for you to participate in decentralized governance in the future. So please, for now, just keep an eye to our Discord server. Uh, thank you so much, Aureliano. So uh, guys, this was a lot uh, to take in, uh, but uh, we were super keen to start communicating with the, with the community. Uh, let's do a quick recap of the main takeaways from the presentation. Uh, we've introduced an innovative AMM for risk management derivatives uh, uh, based on the criterion. We have seen how this enables automated risk management, and we've seen how backtesting shows best-in-class management of risk, uh, including uh, crypto environments. We've gone through some of our backtesting and UX showing that LPs will be able to specify their risk reward preferences individually, as opposed to being exposed to a large pool with no control. Uh, we've gone through our commitment to designing a system that is built for the many, not for the few, and to creating a system that can be used by anybody, regardless of your financial uh, level of knowledge. And finally, uh, hopefully we've also outlined some of our more philosophical viewpoints around decentralization and trustlessness and how our ultimate goal is to contribute to the community, contribute to a community driven service uh, for the benefit of uh, the entire ecosystem. And uh, we wanted to finish with a tweet from a few days ago from Dan Elitzer that really resonated with us. And if it's okay, I'll, I'm gonna read it. The most successful DeFi products will be the ones that realize the truth. They are not lending or exchange protocols, but liquidity protocols. Lending, exchange, futures, options, these are just starting points. What matters is sitting on the efficient frontier of risk and return. And we think that uh, with the Kelly machine, we are taking a major step forward exactly in this direction by helping participants more easily find and exploit uh, this frontier. We hope that you guys are excited as we are about the possibilities that uh, can open up. And we really look forward to collaborating together around the project. And I think with this, uh, we concluded the presentation. Uh, let's move to Q&A. Um, I don't know if uh, there are questions in the backlog. So there is a question on uh, network layer one congestion and layer two scalability plans. Uh, this is an interesting one. We've spoken to uh, quite a few uh, teams and we think there is an, an amount of, a huge amount of energy uh, going into that space. Uh, we've, we're very excited, by the way, at looking at how Pope, uh, P-O-A-P, is already uh, working in layer two. And on Twitter, you can see how there are some even some DEXs that already have some significant volume. Our own thinking is that it feels like the direction in which these teams are going is in trying to make Solidity code uh, be able to run just faster and cheaper. And so for us, we decided to, instead of trying to bet in any one of these side chains, to basically continue to focus V0 towards something that will just work on layer one on Ethereum, even though we know that it probably is a, a system that won't be for the long run, but it's good enough to, uh, to test and prove the concept. And then hopefully by the time V0 is out, the market has coalesced around the layer two, and then we can very quickly make, make, the, make the move. Um, there is a question on liquidity mining. Uh, so uh, we absolutely think that uh, the protocol is ripe for, for using 
all the all the mining approaches uh, available. And actually, for us, we don't we not only think about liquidity mining but also uh, usage mining. So I think there is an opportunity to, to reward early participants in the service, not just on the LP side, but also on the user side. Uh, but I also want to mention that I don't think this would necessarily be uh, our decision. The, the way we think about it is uh, we want to really accelerate the path towards decentralization. And so this would most likely be a decision that the DAO would take. And so if the DAO wanted to do liquidity mining or anything else, then it would be have the power uh, to do so. I don't know if the rest of the team has any questions. Um, so I see an interesting question about, do you have plans to integrate partner with current platforms in the ecosystem? Um, so that's a, a really good question. We have spent a huge amount of time in creating this pricing layer. So a lot of our energy has been in testing the mathematics and really checking whether the things that we thought might work would actually work. And so a lot of our energy has, has been concentrated on that and not so much on the settlement layer. So not so much on the actual option itself. And so actually we think that there are opportunities to integrate our platform with other existing protocol technologies. This is gonna reduce our lead time very significantly. And we think that our edge is more on the pricing side rather than on the settlement and execution side uh, necessarily. We also have some exciting partnerships with, uh, with UMA lined up uh, for some stuff that we're incredibly excited about. So yeah, I think our approach is very much towards contributing value and participating in the ecosystem. So moving away from trying to uh, build all the layers and instead just plugging in to the to the DeFi ecosystem uh, uh, with the rest of Legos. There's also a question about uh, whether V0 is gonna be open source. Um, and yeah, I mean, the intention is certainly to open source uh, as much as we possibly can, as soon as we possibly can. Um, on the smart contract side, at least that's, that's uh, likely to happen after we've had the, the contracts professionally audited. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we're now uh, at the top of the hour. Uh, guys, we're really excited about, uh, about this and uh, it took us a long time to reconnect with the community because uh, we were trying to handle all these problems that we've been going through. Over the next, uh, uh, the coming month, uh, weeks and months, we will keep releasing new information. We didn't want to overwhelm people with too much information at once. So I, I hope that you guys uh, can join our Discord and we really look forward to engaging with the community, both the DeFi community as well as the financial community. We, we think we're doing some pretty wild new stuff. And so we're keen to uh, get it looked at by as many people as possible uh, and really contribute to the, the community, which is our overarching North Star. So with that, uh, thank you very much, everyone, and look forward to our next call. Uh, see you all on Discord and over Twitter. Uh, thank you, everyone.